Next up is our presenter, John Bollinger. Uh, now, John Bollinger is definitely a name that everybody is going to be familiar with. Uh, the, the, uh, the inventor of the Bollinger Bands is what most people know him for. But what you're going to learn today is what John has done with the Bollinger Bands over the years and the different aspects that you're able to pull out of Bollinger Bands. I've had the pleasure of being with John at uh, some of our Betastock users conferences that we do and seeing his presentations. And you're really going to understand the movement of the markets using Bollinger Bands. So let's go ahead and get uh, John on here and have him start his presentation. If you're ready, John, let's go ahead and get you going. Let me get you uh, unmuted and get you ready to go. Morning, Kelly. Good morning, John. Let me, uh, I'm just giving you the ability here to share your screen and get everything uh, ready to go. And you are now the presenter and should have the ability to share your screen. So the, the sound is not on at the moment. John's just uploading his PowerPoint, and then we will continue on with the presentation. So give us just uh, one more moment. Okay, are we ready? Yeah, we are ready to go, John. Can you see, um, uh, can, can you see my um, PowerPoint? Yes, uh, PowerPoint is uploaded and, uh, and is showing. Excellent. So uh, first of all, that's Steve Bigelow. He really knows a lot about candlesticks, huh? I remember years ago when we were first, I'm sorry, I remember years ago when we were first uh, um, starting to get interested in candlesticks, there was only one book available in the American market. It was uh, Shaky Shimuzu's, um, it was Shaky Shimuzu's um, chart, Japanese chart of charts. And um, uh, one guy in Chicago uh, imported them by hand. Um, it was really hard to learn about um, candlesticks in those days, but obviously um, these days there are a lot of great resources, including Stephen. So uh, um, I've been a huge fan of candlesticks for, for many years. Um, I'd like to, to start by talking a little bit about my relationship with Metastock. I've been using Metastock since it was first written. Um, I remember the, the first Windows ed edition of Metastock and um, have worked with this crew over the years. I, I might even guess that uh, um, with the exception of one or two people back at the, uh, back at the, the home office there, I'm, I'm probably um, one of the ones who's been using it the longest. Um, so uh, we, we've had a very long and very productive relationship with Metastock. We have a, a couple of um, packages um, available with Metastock right now. One's a Bollinger Band toolkit. Another's a, a trading system based on Bollinger Bands and an article I wrote in um, a magazine, today's sponsor actually, Technical Analysis of Stocks and Commodities. So that right now we have two uh, um, Metastock add-ins that you can explore, with, check out some of the ideas we're going to talk about today. And in addition, we're working um, with Metastock on a couple of new um, a couple of new packages um, that will be coming out later this year I think you'll find very interesting. So with that, I'd like to thank Kelly for inviting me um, to speak with you today. Um, you know, a parakeet joke, Stephen closed with a parakeet joke. Well, you know, I happen to know a parrot joke, but uh, maybe I should save that for, for, for a couple minutes just so, you know, we'll, um, we'll move to the parrot joke just a little bit later. So. Our aim in trading and our aim today is always to be relative, to, to, to ask the markets um, what we want to know at any given point of time and to separate our emotions from trading. I say um, it's always to be relative because it, it's, it's very important. Um, Bollinger Bands define um, whether price is high or low on a relative basis and uh, um, that's going to be a theme that we're going to look at today and I think it's very important. Um, to look at in your trading. A lot of people tend to use um, absolute levels um, and um, I, I find that that's um, rather troublesome. I, I think it, it causes people to focus on, um, 
on the level rather than the reality of the marketplace. For example, if Joe Blow comes out and says the XYZ is going to trade at 122.44 on July July 9th, you know, people's attention is focused on 122.44 in July 9th, whereas people's attentions really should be focused on the development of the price structure between now and July 9th to see what sort of opportunities are available. And that's what we mean by um, being relative, paying attention to what's happening um, right now in the marketplace um, and um, taking uh, that information to eliminate the emotions from the trading process. So we want to um, we want to explore the two dimensions of profitability and, and they are pretty straightforward. Um, we can increase um, our winning trades as our percent of total trades, or we can increase the size of the winners relative to the size of the losers. These are really the only two avenues that are available to better our performance. Um, we can modify the rate at which we earn um, by looking at frequency, but the actual system dynamics are governed by those two ideas. Um, the number of winning trades versus the number of total trades and the size of the winners relative to the size of the losers. So these are key concepts. And we're gonna, today we're going to look at um, setups using Bollinger Bands where um, we we'll have a, a good percentage chance of winning and um, the place um, where we're where we would know that we are wrong um, is is located close by versus the pro a profit target or a profit potential um, that's much greater. So we're going to look for setups where uh, the odds are in our favor and we risk a relatively small amount um, it, versus um, the potential uh, gain that the market might offer at that stage of the game. So once we know our trading stats, our winning percent and our win-loss ratio, um, and also um, have some information about drawdowns that, that we experience during the trades, we can compute our optimal trade size. And once we've done that, we can exploit our edge to the fullest. This is the, the part that most traders tend to skip, but it's, it's really the most important part. Ralph Vinces addressed this idea very strongly in, in his work, um, and the importance can, cannot be overstated. Um, if, um, say we have a, a, a simple trading system and we calculate the optimal trade size as 25% uh, um, um, of the available capital um, to that system. So each time we, we make a trade, we commit 25% of the, of the available capital. If we commit 20% um, instead, what we'll find is um, that we'll underperform. We won't exploit our edge to um, it, its fullest possible advantage. And some people may wish to do that out of a sense of conservatism. I don't have any problem with that. But the problem occurs that if we go on the other side of 0.25 or, or 25%, if we start committing 30% of our capital or 32% or 33% of our capital um, to, to each trade, what we find is, is that the performance of the system, the performance of our edge deteriorates rapidly. And um, as we move up a relatively small amount from the optimal um, trade size, we find that the system will actually start losing money. Um, so this is a very, very important dynamic and one that's not focused on um, by many people. So let's look at trading bands in general and Bollinger Bands in, in specific and how those can help us achieve our aims. Again, we're going to look for setups where um, we're going to risk a relatively small amount um, versus a potential gain that's somewhat larger and um, where the odds are in our favor. So I like to use uh, um, Bollinger Bars. Um, it's sort of a combination of Japanese candlesticks and Western bar charts. So Bollinger Bars can be seen as a marriage of Western bar charts and Japanese candlestick charts where we use color coding to, to fill in the information. Um, the idea is to give the best and easiest um, possible way of reading um, the price data that, that is possible. We were born with fantastic pattern recognition engines, um, and um, I think that these, uh, these Bollinger Bars um, allow us to see the, the price 
dimension, the, the, the price formation process um, in, its, it is in its full um, glory very, very easily. So um, this is what Bollinger Bars look like. Um, they're, they're, they're simply candlesticks um, where we've made the, the candle um, the, the same width from top to bottom. And the, the portion between the open and close is red when the close is lower than the open and green um, where the, when the close is higher than the open. The blue portion of the bars is that portion of the day's range that is outside of the range from the open to close. So if we look over here, um, whoops, if we look over here, we can see that the we're sliding down in, in price into what we call a momentum low here. And we're going to focus on this pattern in the center of the chart um, uh, repeatedly during our talk today. We can see that we have very strong impulses to the downside. We have a little bit of recovery and then a couple more strong impulses to the downside. So this first low that occurred um, just about the end of May, uh, we call a momentum low in the market. And this second low is the final price low in the market. And that occurred um, just in the middle of June. So um, we're going to focus on this process all throughout um, today's talk. Um, this will be a, a, a center, a center um, thought for us today. So the first thing we're going to do is add volume to this display. Um, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna say, um, what is high volume and what is low volume? If we go back and look at this chart, we can see the momentum low was put in at very, very high volume, and the final price low was put in at much lower volume. So, but what is high volume and what is low volume? We're going to use a moving average to answer that question. And this is the first time that relativity is going to figure into today's talk. So what we've done is draw a 50-period moving average on the volume clip here. By definition now, price above the moving average is high volume. By definition, price below the moving average is low volume. You can see over here as we consolidated at the prior highs, and we're going to talk about this consolidation pattern again a couple of times. We can see, for example, as we consolidated, we ran at very low volume levels, which is exactly what we would expect in a consolidation. If this were, in fact, a reversal, um, pattern, we would expect that on the down days, uh, on the periods in which we had red bars, the volume would be picking up above the moving average, but it's not, which is one of the reasons that we understand that this is, in fact, a good consolidation pattern. So we can improve upon that a little bit better by mathematically grabbing the ends of that moving average and pulling them, pulling them straight. So we call this normalized volume, and it's simply volume divided by its 50-day moving average. We multiply by 100 just for convenience sake. And that looks like this. Now we can see, um, again, that at our, our momentum low, um, normalized volume was, was, in fact, very high. And um, at our final price low, normalized volume was very low. And again, during this consolidation that we're going to look at, volume never got above its moving average, which is exactly um, what we would expect. So by definition, using a moving average, normalized volume, when normalized volume is greater than 100, it's high volume. When normalized volume is less than 100, it's low volume. Or better yet, we can use displaced thresholds. We can say um, if normalized volume is greater than 125, uh, it's high volume, and if normalized volume is less than 80, it, it's low volume. And the volume between 125 and 80 is actually uh, normal volume. Now, why would we do that? Um, because, you know, the precision of a, a fixed level like 100 is, is, is simply a, a, a little too crisp for us. I mean, who's to say that uh, normalized volume of 99 today is low volume? versus normalized volume 101 tomorrow is high volume. I, I think we need a, a, a broader range to determine those things. And by imposing this interval, um, we, we impose a certain amount of humility about the process. So now we say when normalized volume is greater than 125, it's high volume. When normalized volume is less than 80, it's low volume. That range between 80 and 125, it's just sort of ordinary volume, everyday normal activity. 
So um, in order to understand a little bit of what we're going to talk about today, we have to talk about time frames a little bit. I work with three time frames, short, intermediate, and long. Um, and these have nothing to do with the actual amount of time that's contained in the bars. It might be five-minute bars, it might be hourly bars, daily bars, weekly bars. But they, the length of time inside each bar has nothing to do with our time frames. Our time frames are determined by the tasks that we execute in each time frame. Inter the intermediate term time frame is, the, is a, the primary time frame that we use. It's the time frame in which we make our entry and exit decisions. It's the time frame in which we do our primary analysis. It's the time frame in which we run our systems and monitor our stops. The short-term time frame only has a single task associated with it. It's trade execution. We shift to a very short-term chart when it's time to actually execute a trade so that we get the best possible execution. Um, and then we shift back to the intermediate-term trade intermediate term time frame to monitor that trade. The other um, trade that we have is the, the other trend that we have is the long term time frame, long term trend. And that's purely for background information. Are we in a bull market? Are we in a bear market? Is monetary policy accommodative? Um, is, our, is the interest rate environment conducive to higher stock prices or, or lower stock prices? Um, if we're trading cattle or, 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 or commodities, you know, what's happening with the weather, um, how are the trains running, um, are the storage, uh, um, are, are, is there a lot of grain in storage and, and, and such like that. It's our, our background information. So again, short term is our, our only for trade execution. Intermediate term is the term that we do our actual analysis. We run our systems and, and, and identify our exits and entries, monitor our stops, and long term is for back information. The biggest mistake that most traders make is they make an intermediate trend um, decision, say um, buy XYZ um, with a stop, um, maybe a chandelier stop um, beneath it, and, and they move then to the short term to execute that trade, and then they fail to move back to the intermediate term. So they're stuck watching a very short term chart that's very volatile, and it, as price moves back and forth, the, the, their emotions get the best of them to get shaken out, out of the trade for a pullback that may have just have been a few points that wouldn't have meant anything in, in the intermediate term trade. So it's very important to, to revert back to the intermediate term trade to monitor our trades and our actions and run our analysis. And you only use the short term for execution, only use the long term trade for background information. So. The next uh, um, piece that we're going to add to our chart that we're building up solely here um, is a measure of the intermediate term trend. Um, and for my for for the work that I do and the way that I was trained in the market, that's going to be a 21 period moving average using daily data. But it could be anything. If you're a very short term trader, it might be a 15 period moving average of five-minute bars. It, if you're a very long-term trader, it could be a 50-period moving average of weekly bars. Um, it, it's up to you to decide. Um, for me, I primarily use daily charts, and um, I primarily use that 21-period moving average. And the purpose of this is to, for two things, it's to define the direction of the intermediate-term trend. You can see that um, prices rise generally um, when the move average is rising. When the average is falling, prices are generally in a, in a falling mode. Um, and the average reverses quite nicely um, with the major swings in the market. Um, we've been using a 21 period moving average for many years. And for most things in, in America and in Europe and, and, and in parts of Asia, 20 or 21 period moving average turns out to be a very good definition of the immediate term trend. We're also going to use it as a base for our trading band. So it's very important to, um, um, to understand that it, those are the two roles that it's going to serve. It's going to serve as a base for the trading band. It's going to serve as an indication of the direction of the intermediate term trend. But it's not going to give us a lot of information when it's crossed over. Um, it's going to be too long for that purposes. So the, the crossover signals are not going to be um, very useful. You can see here, for example, we get crossed over and, and whipsawed. And if we had actually done this, this trade bought here when we crossed positively and sold here when we crossed negative, 
if we would have lost through three or four points that this chart is of the spiders um, so we would have lost three or four S, uh, SPY points uh, again the, pur the purpose of this is to define the intermediate term trend whether it's rising or falling and to serve as a base for um, the trading bands that we're going to build which are going to be Bollinger bands so here's a, a little example of, of what these look like when they're right what they look like when they're wrong I've drawn a, um, some syn synthetic data here. Um, prices fall by one point per period until we make a low. They then rally by one point per, per period for 20 periods, and then fall again by one point per period for 10 periods, and then rally to the end of the chart. Um, we have three moving averages drawn on here, red, um, green, and blue, uh, short, ideal, and long, or short, intermediate, and long. The short average is 10 periods. The Intermediate average is 20 periods, and the long average is 50 periods. Uh, let's deal with the long average first. It's um, way too long for our purposes here. Um, it gets crossed only after the entire bottom is completed. And what's really important is, is it doesn't turn up until this period right in, in this range here, um, long after the bottom is completed and the rally is going. The, Red average is the short-term moving average is too short. It gets crossed nicely um, early on in the process, as uh, uh, you, you might expect, but it gets whipsawed on the first pullback. Um, and um, it says um, here by turning up um, that the trend is shifted to intermediate term positive, when in fact we're still in the middle of the bottoming process. So it's too long, too short, I'm sorry. The um, green ar average. 20 period average is ideal for our purposes. It gets crossed on the first leg up, provides support on the first pullback, and turns up on the very first day that the new uptrend is born. So it's it's perfect average for our our, our purposes. So now we get asked the question: Are prices relatively high or low? We've determined whether volume is relatively high or low. We can add Bollinger bands to our chart to answer that question. So Bollinger Bands are a middle band, the moving average generally 20 or 21, but that's a very robust number. Um, we can, you know, easily back it down to 18 or 19 with, without much change in the dyna overall dynamics. We can easily lengthen it up to 21 or 22 um, without much uh, um, change again. Uh, so we say it's robust because small changes in values don't um, tend to change the operational characteristics very much. Um, I usually use for Bollinger Bands a moving average of 20 periods, um, but um, anything in that range from 15 to 25 um, works really well. If you start to get down towards 10 for some applications, um, you'll see the, the, the bands become quite volatile. Um, and some people like to get out as far as 50 periods for other applications. Bands become very smooth. Um, as, as you, you might expect. Um, I, I say that really if you want to get out of the range from roughly 15 to 30 periods, you're better off modifying the amount of data inside the bars. So if you're using um, um, daily bars and you find you want to push the, the average up around 30, 35, 40 periods, um, maybe it's uh, um, better to go to two-day bars and move back to 20 periods. Um, so that the Bollinger Bands have the normal sorts of responsiveness that you that you might expect. And the same on the downside. If you if you find that you're wanting to, you're using daily bars and you're wanting to push the the average for your purposes down towards towards ten periods, maybe you better go to hourly bars and you know move the average back toward twenty and see if that doesn't work better for you. I think it will. Um, basically, that range from about fifteen to twenty five is sort of the ideal. Um, uh, number of periods for Bollinger Bands. So the upper band is uh, um, simply the moving average plus a, a variable called width times volatility. And volatility is the standard deviation of the, of the same data that was moved, moved, used in the moving average. And width is a constant. Usually it's two. But it can be anything from about one to three depending on your application. The lower band is simply that moving average minus um, width times volatility. And again, volatility is the standard deviation of the same data that was used in the moving average. So here we have uh, Bollinger Bands. They provide our 
definitional prices, whether prices are relatively high or relatively low. By definition, prices are relatively high at the upper band. By definition, prices are relatively low at the lower band. And you can see that during an uptrend, we get multiple tags of the lower band, of the upper band, very few or no tags of the lower band during a downtrend. Um, we get multiple tags of the lower band, um, very few, if any, tags of the upper band. So um, our definition here of prices being relatively high or relatively low works very well. We can use that definition in pattern recognition. Um, for example, we're going to look at, at this W bottom here. Um, we're outside the lower band on the momentum low, and, and we're unable to get outside the lower band on the final price low. Um, so we can talk more about that. Um, we can also um, use this definition um, to create trading systems and compare um, price action to indicator action. So Bollinger Bands define whether price is high or low on, definition, on a relative basis. By definition, prices are high at the upper Bollinger Band, and by definition, prices are low on the Bollinger Band. Now, you're on the honor system here because I'm going to ask you to repeat after me, and I can't hear you because your microphones, if you have them, are muted. So again, you're on the honor system. I'm trusting that you're going to do this. So repeat after me. Prices are high at the upper Bollinger Band by definition. Ah, good. You did that. And uh, um, repeat again after me. Prices are low at the lower Bollinger Band by definition. Nah, I think a few of you didn't repeat that again. So let's try once again. Prices, by definition, Prices are high at the upper Bollinger Band, and prices are low at the lower Bollinger Band. Very good. You all get a gold star for today's um, participation. Volatility is what drives the Bollinger Bands. There are many measures of volatility. So the bands we use the most common definition, standard deviation. The reason we use that is um, standard deviation is very sensitive to large changes in price. So if we've been for example, we've been trading in a narrow range, and we start to trend to break away from the from the average. Uh, the bands will adapt very quickly to that. So, um, standard deviation measures dispersion around the average, and here are a couple examples of that. So, here, here are 20 data points that have an average value of 20 in a range of 19 to 21. And here's the second chart of volatility. Again, 20 data points, uh, average of 20, but now the range is 15 to 25. So in both cases, the average price is 20, but the volatility is quite different. Um, that first chart where we had a range of 19 to 21, the standard deviation was 0 0.6. And the second chart where we had a range of 15 to 25, standard deviation was 3.3. .3. So you can see it's a, a quite a dynamic quantity. It, it adapts to the ranges that the data spans um, very well. So why use standard deviation as a volatility measure? Again, because it emphasizes the outliers. When, when price starts to move away from, from the, the areas that it's been or is in protracted uptrends or protracted downtrends, it keeps our definition of prices being relatively high and relatively low, germane to the price structure. So of all the volatility measures we tried, and we tried uh, seven or eight, or eight different volatility measures, um, it is the most adaptive to rapidly changing prices. Thus, Bollinger Bands are quite sensitive to emerging trends, adapt quickly as price moves away from the average, and keep our definition of relatively high and relatively low germane to the price structure. And that's, that's absolutely vital to success here. So a lot of people say, you know, so you're using Bollinger Bands, and it's, they're plus or minus two standard deviations. They, and they remember that high school statistics teacher, and they go, yeah, aren't, aren't, aren't we supposed to have 95% uh, um, of the data inside, um, inside the Bollinger Bands if we do that? Well, in an ideal world, that would be true, but there are, are some reasons that that's not actually true. Um, first of all, stock prices do not follow a normal distribution. There are, we find in stock prices in general, that there are too many large changes in price, both positive and negative, and too few small changes in price. Um, we call those fat tails, which is another way of saying that stock prices are more volatile than we would expect them to be. And the sample size we're using, typically 20 or, or something in that range, um, is too small for statistical significance. There's another um, reason that I talk about sometimes. Uh, stock prices are not um, stationary. They can rise to the moon or, or, or 
or fall to zero. Um, a stationary series would be something that's swung above and below the zero line or, or, or in, in, in a fixed trading range. So stationarity is not, um, is not present. Another reason that uh, we don't find 95% of the data inside the bands. So what do we find inside the trading bands? Well, actually, um, we find between 88 and 90% of the data inside the Bollinger Bands, and it's a very stable quantity. It's true for gold and commodities, Forex, most, mo most kinds of stocks. Um, um, for very volatile, very junior stocks or, or very thinly traded commodities, um, we may find um, some different values there. But the vast majority of financial instruments that you get you're going to find, um, you're going to find about 88 to 90 percent of the data inside the bands. So what does that mean in practical terms? Well, if we follow the standard assumption, we would expect to see about 2.5 percent of the data points above the upper band on average and about 2.5 percent of the data points below the lower band on average. But in reality, we find about 5 percent of the data points above the upper band on average and about 5 percent of the data points um, beneath the lower band on average. Um, in an uptrend, that'll be more like 8 or 9 percent above the upper average and just a, a, a percent or two or maybe even none below the lower average. And in downtrend, we'll see exactly the opposite. There'll be lots of data beneath the lower, beneath the lower band um, and almost no data above the upper band. So relativity is the key to this sort of technical analysis. Absolutes are eliminated. The market is used to answer questions wherever possible. This is the key to eliminating emotions from the trading investment process. So I'm going to talk about my, the, the, the first Bollinger Band trading approach I developed. It was, in fact, the reason um, that I developed Bollinger Bands. And we're going to compare tags to the Bollinger Bands with the action of a volume indicator. We're going to sell if we tag the upper band and the indicator is negative. And we're going to buy if we tag the lower band um, and the indicator is positive. So in order to do this, I'm going to have to introduce you to a, a volume indicator. This one is called Intraday Intensity. It was created by the economist David Bostin, who was really interested in studying the supply-demand characteristics of institutional traders. Um, this measures accumulation and distribution with an emphasis on institutional traders. And you see the formula there. I don't, there's no need to, to worry about that. It's, it's in the software, um, so you can just use it as is. But that first part of the formula that says 2 times the close minus the high and low, that quantity divided by the high and low, is actually a pretty clever um, formula. And that's it's what makes the, what makes the, the um, indicator work. Um, the indicator can be presented either as a running sum, as an oscillator, as you see um, down in, in, in this area of the chart, or as, as an, an open line. Um, the formula is pretty unique in that it evaluates to 1 if we close at the high of each day, and it evaluates to minus 1 if we close at the low of the day, um, and evaluates to 0 if we close at mid-range of the period. So we multiply that by volume. So if we're consistently closing near the highs of the day, we accumulate volume. And if we're consistently closing near the lows of the day, we distribute volume. So here we see the, the, the very first Bollinger Band trading approach that I developed and a trading approach which works to this day. Um, and in fact, I programmed this into a very early version of Metastock and was very happy using this for a very long time. So we have circled two areas on the chart. The first is a confirmed tag of the lower band. Price is able to tag the lower band and the indicators deep in negative territory. On the right-hand side here, we have a totally different situation. Price tags the lower band here, and we have the indicators strongly in positive territory. So we have a confirmed tag of the lower band followed by an unconfirmed tag of the lower band. We wait for the first up day, that's this day right here, and that's our actual sig signal or entry day. Why do we wait for the first up day? Because we want to improve our odds of success. If we, w By waiting for um, confirmation from the market, we move from, say, 60 or 65 percent success rate to 65 or 70 percent success rate. That may not seem like much, but it actually is very important because it improves the overall performance of our edge and allows us to use an optimal trade size that's quite a bit larger. So the other piece here 
that we're talking that, that's important to note is that where we're wrong. Um, here, um, the lower band is right down here. So if we make a, a, a new low here and um, tag the lower band again, we know that we're wrong. And so we're risking a relatively small amount in comparison to the sort of potential gain that we see here as the market erupts into a rally. So by doing this sort of analysis, by comparing the action of price within trading bands, um, to the action of a supply demand or an accumulation distribution indicator, we're dealing with both parts of the puzzle that are important to us. We're dealing with our success rate um, and we're dealing with um, the amount risk versus the potential for gain. So in order to go on, we must now introduce the two most basic and powerful Bollinger Band indicators. They are percent B and bandwidth, and of course these are available on the Metastock platform. Uh, percent B tells us where we are in relation to the Bollinger Bands. Um, the formula is derived directly from stochastics. The, here you see the formula for stochastics, which tells us where we are in our price range. It's the last minus the lowest low divided by the highest high minus the lowest low. We're going to just sub out the upper band for the highest high, and, and we're going to sub out the lower band for the lowest low, and we're going to end up with, the, with percent B. Um, last minus the lowest band divided by the upper band minus the lower band. So this is going to be 1 if we're at the upper band. It's going to be 0 if we're at the lower band. It's going to be 0.5 at the middle band. If we're trading below the lower band, it's going to be a number less than 0. And if we're trading above the upper band, it's going to be a number greater than 1. So we're going to go back to this idea of absolute versus relative and back to our original chart. And we're going to further define our W bottom. The definition of a W bottom in terms of Bollinger Bands is a new absolute low in price that is not a new low relative to the Bollinger Bands. And again, I'm going to trust you to repeat after me this definition. You know, I've turned on all your microphones so I can hear whether you're doing this or not. Um, so the definition of a W bottom in terms of Bollinger Bands is a new absolute low in price that is not a new low relative to the Bollinger Brands. So here we have a, a, a picture of that. Um, we're back to our same chart, so we've added another piece here. We've replaced volume for the moment. We've pre replaced it with percent B. So you can see we've made a new absolute low in price here. That's pretty obvious. And we can see from percent B that it is not a new low in relation to the Bollinger Bands. So we've added a piece here. Um, and we're sort of building up evidence of what's going on. The other indicator that we're going to add here is bandwidth. Um, bandwidth tells us how wide the Bollinger Bands are. Bandwidth is best compared across time as a function of prior peaks and troughs rather than absolute values. The reason for this is some stocks will have different ranges for bandwidth. For one stock, 5 to 25 will be you know, a very wide range. For another stock, it'll be 5 to 50. Um, so it's very hard to know um, what that will be uh, in advance. So for any stock, we just go back and look at the value of the peaks in bandwidth and the value of the troughs in bandwidth, and that gives us, gives us a feeling for what bandwidth will be for that stock. So bandwidth itself is very easy to um, uh, calculate. It's just the distance from the upper band to the lower band, and we normalize that or make it a relative value by dividing it by the middle band. So the two most uh, um, important aspects of bandwidth are the bulge and the squeeze. The bulge is a peak in bandwidth, and it is a forecast for decreased volatility. That's correct. High volatility is a forecast for low volatility. And the squeeze is a trough in bandwidth, or a, a, a very low value in, in volatility. And it is a forecast for increased volatility. And again, that is correct. Um, that um, very low volatility is a forecast for high volatility. So the bulges occur at the end of moves, and squeezes occur at the beginning of moves. So um, the bulge is uh, the death of a, uh, of a move, and the squeeze uh, is the birth of a move. So here we have um, um, bandwidth um, in terms of April gold. Um, here we have um, circled 
a very important concept. Um, it's it's a squeeze. You can see that by the really low value of, of bandwidth down here. Um, it's actually about 3.5, which for gold is, is in fact a very low value. Um, but the squeeze occurs at a logical place. I've drawn this blue arrow here because it's very important. Um, the squeeze occurs at a logical place. Um, and we see this happen time and time and time again in the marketplace. Um, it will come up and we'll make a high, we'll pull back, um, we'll come back and retest um, resistance at the high, prices will squeeze and set up for the big move. We wait for the update to confirm our opinion and we get to participate in this very nice rally. Um, Here's the chart that we've been working with all along, and we see that bandwidth turns down at the momentum low um, and is at a much lower price, uh, much lower level when we make the final price low. Now you see this little kink in bandwidth here? This often happens when we're making a W bottom. We'll make a hot, we'll make a momentum low, bandwidth will turn down immediately after the momentum low, we'll come back and retest the final price low, and we get a little kink. In, in bandwidth here, bandwidth is already much lower than it was at the momentum low, um, and then bandwidth will continue down as the rally starts to materialize. So we've added yet another piece, right? So we have three independent pieces of information here, or, or for actually four independent pieces of information here. We've made a momentum low followed by a price low. The momentum low was outside the lower band, and the price low was inside the lower band, which was confirmed by percent B. We've had much higher volume on the momentum low than we did on the price low, and bandwidth turned down at the momentum low and is much lower at the final price low. So we're building up a case. We're building up evidence. And the reason we're doing this is when we build up evidence like this, we have a much higher chance of success. So our entry day is right here. Our immediate potential is a trip to the upper band. And if this bottom resolves, then a meaningful rally. So the amount we risk is relatively small compared to the potential for gain. And by using all these independent pieces of evidence, our potential for success um, is higher than it would be without those pieces. So we've been working um, very hard on the new set of Bollinger Band indicators. These will be um, part of the new um, Metastock Toolkit that we're going to work with um, Kelly and his crew on the, in the early part of this year. I can't see. It's already March. How can I say the early part of this year? Um, in, in the spring, into the spring and er, er, early summer, um, we'll bring out a new version of, of the Metastock Toolkit for Bollinger Bands. Um, we'll have these. Um, in volume indicators, we created a, um, an indicator called BB accumulation that takes advantage of accumulation distribution, intraday intensity, and on balance volume. In momentum indicators, we've created an indicator um, called BB momentum that normalizes momentum in relation to the Bollinger Band so that in consolidations where prices are very tight, change of shifts in momentum are magnified, and during very strong trends, we're where the bands are very wide, um, shifts in momentum are are minimized um, so that we can only see the important tops as they develop. Um, in terms of market stake indicators, like um, the at ADX or the vertical horizontal filter, we have have two new Bollinger Band indicators, BB Trend and BB Persist. And in terms of just sheer raw strength in the marketplace, um, we have a new indicator called BB Impulse that measures how much percent B changes um, on a periodic basis. And then um, you've already met percent B that tells us where we are in relation to the Bollinger Bands. It's very related to stochastics. Um, and um, in the overbought, oversold area, um, we have um, BB Index, um, quite similar um, in, in concept to the Commodity Channel Index, but normalized for the Bollinger Bands. Um, and another indicator in that area would be uh, the deviation from the average. And volatility indicators, we have bandwidth and bandwidth delta. You've already met bandwidth. You know that it, it tells you how wide the bands are. Bandwidth delta simply tells you um, how bandwidth is changing across time. And percent bandwidth applies the formula for stochastics to bandwidth, so we no longer have to guess 
whether we're at a bulge or a squeeze, if uh, percent bandwidth is um, 100, we have a bulge, and if percent bandwidth is zero, we have a squeeze. So what we've done is scale uh, bandwidth with 125 period stochastic. So I'm going to talk a little bit about hips and lops here because it, it's it's an important um, it's an important tool to be using in relation here, and it's another piece of confirmatory evidence. So a hip is a high surrounded by two lower highs, and a lop is a low surrounded by two lower lows. Um, they were um, created by Henry Wheeler Chase in the 1930s. So they may have had some prior art, but the earliest um, um, reference we can find are the circled highs and lows of Henry Wheeler Chase. Um, it is, they're simply a, a high um, with a lower high before it and after it. You see it circled right here or a low with a higher low before it and a higher low after it. So here's a picture of a, a hip, it's simply a high with two lower highs before and after, and a lop low with two higher lows before it and after it. So hips and lops can be of any order. I generally use hips and lops of an order of two. They require two lower highs and two lower highs on each side, two higher lows and two higher lows on each side of a lot. Now, they don't have to be in perfect order. Um, they can be um, in any order. Um, so uh, a hip of an order of two just requires um, that the two highs before it and the two highs after it be lower than the hip itself, but they don't have to be in, they don't have to have occurred in any order. The same for a lop. So they're not exclusive. They can occur simultaneously. You get this sort of situation um, where, where you have both a hip and a lop in the same bar. Um, this simply cancels itself out. Um, it's an outside day followed by an inside day for those of you people who study price patterns. Um, and um, you have actually neither a hip nor a lop here. So they're very useful as pattern matching tools. Um, the hips and lops in and of themselves aren't that interesting. However, hips and lops inside or outside the Bollinger Bands are very interesting. So um, you get this sort of, of, of situation um, where you have a, a lop and then another lop and another lop. And I never would have seen this inverted head and shoulders pattern in the middle of this chart if I hadn't been drawing these hips and lops on, on this chart on this chart. These are hips and lops of an order of two. So they make them um, clear as I'm just going to zoom back to our to the chart that we've been working with and you'll see instantly that we have a lop here and a lop here. So we have a low point at the momentum low and we have a low point at the final price low. And in between the two of them, we have a hip. So the definition of a W bottom in relation to Bollinger Bands is a lop that is outside the lower band, followed by a hip inside the lower inside the bands, followed by a lop at the lower band. So that's the definition of a W bottom. So we've added yet another piece of evidence to our analysis of charts. So I have one more here. I, I again, I never would have seen this little head and shoulder head and shoulders pattern um, developing here, and I was purposely focused on these two head and shoulders patterns so that I could um, so that you know you can see the value of this pattern matching sort of approach in relation to Bollinger Bands. A head and shoulders pattern, by definition, now has it is a it consists of three hips, one inside the band, followed by one outside the band, followed by one inside the band, and of course, um, two lops um, here and here. So, so a little bit of review here as we're running out of time. The Bollinger Bands define whether price is high or low on a relative basis. Percent B tells us where we are in relation to the Bollinger Bands. Bandwidth tells us how wide the bands are. We're looking for trade setups where the odds are in our favor. Risk and reward is, is, is a key criteria here, and reward needs to be 
greater than risk, I, I tend to keep in my mind the criteria of two um, for one. You know, I'd like um, my potential reward always to be greater than twice the amount that I'm risking. Obviously, if you can get that to be even better than that, it's, it's better. Um, and um, we like to minimize our drawdowns. In terms of the odds being in our favor, I'd like the odds to be at least 60%. That's a personal bias. I've seen perfectly good trading systems um, with odds as low as 50%. Some are even with worse odds than that in the, in the 40% range because the risk reward criteria was so much greater where they were risking relatively small amounts and, and, and the reward um, potential was much, much greater. So you have those sorts of trading systems. For me, that's not the sort of thing I like. I like um, systems that have the odds of at least 60, 65 percent um, and reward um, at least twice the amount of risk. Um, and again, I like to focus on minimizing drawdowns. We can get a lot done with just a few simple Bollinger Band tools. Well, all we looked at today was percent B, bandwidth, volume indicators, and um, hips and lops. And we saw three different approaches um, to, uh, to identifying potential patterns with Bollinger Bands. We saw a W bottom. We saw um, a non-confirmed tag of the lower band with a volume indicator. And we saw um, um, we saw head and shoulders patterns buried in the price structure that were delineated by hips and lops in relation to the Bollinger Bands. So we add other pieces very carefully here. Um, only one type of each tool. Avoid unnecessary complexity. Um, no, don't use two or three volume indicators or two or three momentum indicators. Use one volume indicator, one momentum indicator, independent voices for each piece of the analysis. If you notice, as I added up the pieces of the analysis when we looked at the, at the W bottom, each of those was a non-correlated independent piece of information. Thus, it gave us greater confidence as we completed our analysis. So keep the trade keep your trade tasks in the, in the correct frame. Most importantly, after you enter a trade, remember to go back to the intermediate term to monitor that trade. Use relatives, not absolutes, and never, never, never argue with the market. So capture your trade stats. Find your correct position size. If you want to know more about position sizing, look up a guy by the name of Ralph Vince. Um, he's written um, uh, a great deal of material on position sizing. Uh, I think he's written the, absolutely the best material on position sizing. Here are some websites that you can visit at us. The main one is BollingerBands.com, but if you want some, um, if you want some uh, Bollinger Band analytics, um, you uh, can come to um, bbands.com, and in fact, you will get a 30-day um, free subscription to bbands.com as um, a thank you for attending um, the seminar today. And um, um, finally, a couple of pieces about the Bollinger Band Toolkit for Metastock. Um, as it exists now, um, there are 42 indicators, some charting templates, templates, nine example systems, uh, six explorations, and four experts. Um, we're actually going to rework this pretty dramatically um, coming in, into, the, in, into the new year. And uh, we also have a Bollinger Band trading system um, based on an article that was published in today's sponsors, Technical Analysis of Stocks and Commodities. And I'm going to ask you once again to repeat after me, Bollinger Bands define high and low on a relative basis. Oh, good job. Now, um, um, a guy walks down the street and goes into a pet store, goes into a pet store, and um, he wants to buy a parrot for um, for his daughter, you know, as as a birthday present. Parrot's daughter's been asking um, forever um, about um, getting a parrot, and he goes in, and um, the guy who runs uh, the store um, says, uh, "Yeah, we have uh, three parrots in stock. Um, they're in the back of the store. You can see they're sitting on the, on that bar back there. The one on the left is." Um, um, $10, and the, the one in the middle is $100, and the one on the right is $1,000. And uh, 
the guy says, um, well, you know, the parrots look pretty much alike. Um, what's the difference? And he says, well, the one on the left's uh, um, sort of just an ordinary parrot. He, he, he talks a little bit. He has a, a, a few words and, um, you know, he does poly want a cracker and all that sort of thing. And, you know, he eats crackers and stuff like that. The one in the middle, the one in the middle is actually pretty interesting. Not only is it does he talk, but he, he does a higher math and stuff like that. And he'll be able to, to help you with uh, your trading and, and, and your trading systems and stuff like that. I can, I can tell you're a trader. I guess it's, uh, okay, I'm sort of tempted toward, toward the one in the middle there. But what about the $1,000 one on the right? Uh, how come he's so much? He says, the store owner says, I don't have any idea how come he's uh, um, so expensive. Um, all, all I know is that the other two call him boss. So there you go. That's a that's my parent job. So with that, thank you very much for having uh, um, spent some time with me today. I'll turn the um, I'll turn the um, the um, um, presentation back over to Kelly. Um, it's really been a pleasure to work with Metastock and and technical analysis of stocks and commodities, um, and. Um, it's, um, I look forward to a great day um, listening to the rest of the speakers. Thank you, John. I uh, appreciate the, uh, the presentation as always. Definitely uh, top notch uh, as people are, are putting into the comment field about the excellent instruction. I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, so I did want to just recap really quickly what John said about the BBTK. Uh, all the formulas and systems he discusses in his book, the Bollinger on Bollinger Bands, is in that uh, add-on. Uh, there are going to be some updates to it coming up, but get started with uh, what uh, John has available now in the Bollinger Band Toolkit. So there are actually 42 indicators, three different chart templates, nine different example systems included in there, six explorations, and four experts. So it's actually a very robust uh, toolkit as it stands now and what you would get out of it. Uh, the toolkit itself, if you uh, wanted to get the toolkit, it's $299. Uh, we are offering a summer price of $249. So you can call us at that 800-882-3040. We do have people on the phones who are able to take calls and answer queries about the toolkit or any of the other plugins or add-ons or Metastock if you have any questions. Uh, again, here's the Summit Action Pack and everything that's available as part of the Action Pack with the two months free. Uh, to Metastock Pro included in it. That whole package, uh, normally $2,700, action price today, $1,595. Again, our number 1-800-882-3040. Or you can go to metastock.com slash sales chat. Uh, that will also get you in direct contact with the uh, support, with the sales team, uh, metastock.com slash sales chat. Again, uh, we want to thank our uh, sponsor, Stocks and Commodities Magazine. Uh, all registrants today are going to get a free copy of, uh, of the magazine. Uh, you'll also, if you spend $300 or more on, the, uh, on any of the add-ons uh, or the action pack, you will actually get a two-year subscription to Stocks and Commodities, which is a very gracious offer from Stocks and Commodities, and we appreciate that from them. Uh, Metastock itself has actually won the Reader's Choice Award from Stocks and Commodities for the last 25 years something that we're very, very proud of. Uh, so we invite you to take a trial of Metastock. Uh, give us a call at that 800-882-3040 and we can help you get set up with that.